Hey everybody, welcome to Put Back on SNY.TV. I'm Ian Begley here with my buddy Maurice Peebles, our editor in chief. What's going on, Ian? Let's get into the baseline. After spending five years of his life in Oklahoma City, the Thunder thanked Billy Donovan by parting ways with him last week. Ian, what does this mean for Knicks fans' hopes at CP3? This just makes it more likely that Chris Paul is on the move because if the Thunder were committed to continuing to try to win, Billy Donovan would still be there. So this tells you that they are going to pivot probably into a rebuild. And that tells you that they don't really have a use for Chris Paul going forward. You talk about Chris Paul and the Knicks, we've been talking about it for months. People in the organization feel that he can help fast track their goal of building a winning culture. Why is obvious. The question for the Thunder is, what are you going to ask back for in a Chris Paul trade? There's rumors about the Bucks and the Sixers being interested and it all makes sense. But the thing with the Knicks is, I would think that Oklahoma City is looking for picks or contracts that come off their books right away. The Knicks have a bunch of team options on um, players this offseason. They can exercise those options and include those guys in trades. So that, to me, makes them an attractive trade partner. How do they feel about not-so-young guys who have questionable offensive capabilities but maybe pretty good on defense? Are those trade pieces for OKC, or is that something more of a long shot? If you're OKC, and this is just in my mind, I think they'd be looking for picks and players on like rookie deals who maybe you hit on, maybe you can develop in a way that they haven't panned out in their previous market. So I think that's what they're looking at. They're not looking for a veteran who's under contract for three, four years. I think they want to get their money off the books and, and continue with this rebuild. It makes the Knicks, again, a pretty good trade partner for them. You talk about Milwaukee and the Sixers. I don't know who they can offer that kind of fits that criteria that I think OKC would be looking for. Let's turn our attention to the draft a little bit, Ian. What's the latest with the Knicks in the NBA draft right now? Yeah, I actually spoke to RJ Hampton over the weekend, and he had a Zoom conversation with the Knicks. Leon Rose was on there. Worldwide West, William Wesley was on there. And that was interesting to me because I don't think William Wesley has been on all the Zoom calls with prospects. And RJ said the call went really well. There's certain players that you know have talent that can't play in New York. I think with the Knicks, they know I'm a competitor. They know I'm willing to get better. And I think they know I can handle the, you know, the, the bright lights in New York City. You look at these mock drafts and his stock, has fallen because of the season he had in New Zealand. He didn't put up big numbers, but he was playing for a team that was competing for a title, so he wasn't getting a ton of shots. He's been working a lot with Mike Miller lately, not the ex-Nick coach, the sharpshooter who retired a couple of years ago and was coaching at Memphis recently. He's been working with Miller since March on the perimeter shop. He's learned to simplify things. He's learned how to work on it and consistently work on it. He's learned to be a pro. If he shoots, which I'm pretty confident, in, in the next two or three years, be a high 30, low 40% three-point shooter. He'll be one of the best guards in the, in the league. When a guy like Mike Miller believes in his shot, I mean, that to me would get on my radar if I was an NBA decision maker because, you know, his athleticism is, is unquestioned and he can get to the paint. But if he's able to knock down that perimeter shot, that changes the calculus on RJ Hampton as a prospect. I was, you know, projected top five pick last year. I went overseas. I learned a lot. Uh, I didn't have superior numbers and I was kind of forgotten about, but the message that I was trying to get across to them is I'm still that same player. I'm still that player that can, you know, get you 20, 25 points, six, seven assists, and, you know, be that, you know, that lead guard in the franchise shape. This week's guest is David Nurse, former Nets shooting coach, skills life coach for dozens of NBA players, and author of Pivot and Go, a personal development book. Man, I love Johnny. I've known Johnny for years, and I started developing a relationship with him before he was coaching in the NBA, and he was a player development guy. He was working with Paul Millsap. He just does such a good job relating to players, communicating, and the main thing overall about player development and what he does such a good job of is he cares. He genuinely cares about the players. He's developed some great players. He's done really well in Utah, and He's going to, like, I have full confidence in him that he'll be able to develop this young talent in New York, and you're, you're in good hands out there with him. You know that some of the young guys here, what do you think he can do to get more out of maybe, let's say, an R.J. Barrett, one of their young players? I mean, do you see anything specific there with Johnny and R.J. that you see a path forward? Man, I can, I can see R.J. being kind of like a Jason Tatum, really. He's got all the tools, and I think Johnny can piece that together. Even with the Kevin Knox, I think this – this, this uh, core group that you guys have could be something very special like the Celtics have built out with Jalen Brown and, and, and Tatum. But there's also obviously the idea that he knows the game incredibly well. 
What did you see early on from Johnny or what did you see over the course of his career from uh, a tactical standpoint that allowed him to reach this level uh, as, an, as a coach in the NBA coaching community? Focusing on the details and the specifics for each player. Player development gets thrown around there like a buzz term, like culture. No one really knows what it means. Most of it ends up being just rebounding for players shooting spot shots. Like that's not player development. But Johnny realizes it's about the focused details on helping these players that he works with focus on their strengths. Because there's, there's, you can give me an NBA player and he's good in every area and he's probably not playing in the NBA. But if you can figure out what that player's strengths are and how to get them to their best shots at all times, functioning at 100% capacity on their mindset and their confidence, and Johnny's really good at focusing on those details and making sure that these players are empowered in their strength. Hey, Ian, thanks for taking my question. Been loving the show so far. Mitchell Robinson is without a doubt the most talented young player on the Knicks, but his contract extension is coming up sooner than people think. Do you think the Knicks should pay the high price he'll command at a less than premium position, or should they entertain trading him before they have to do so? And have you gotten a read on how Leon Rose's new front office feels about him as well? Alex, thanks so much for the kind words, man. You and your group have done a great job at the Strickland of breaking down the Mitchell Robinson contract situation. So I highly recommend everybody go over there and check out what you guys have written. If I'm the Knicks, I wanna give Tom Thibodeau extended time to work with Robinson and to assess if he feels that he and his staff can turn Robinson into an elite defensive player and a polished offensive player. If Thibodeau thinks he can, I have no problem strongly considering giving Robinson that extension. But if Thibodeau isn't sold on it, then I would certainly look at potentially trading Robinson because if you're going to land a big player, an elite star in a trade, either Robinson or Barrett is almost certainly going to have to be a part of the deal. You know what? It's it's all about being able to make a pivot. I thought I was playing in the NBA. Now I'm 6'2", unathletic, never dunked a basketball from the middle of nowhere, Cornfields, Iowa. Parents probably should have said play tennis or golf. But I'm thinking I'm playing in the NBA, and I pour everything into that. I got to play overseas, which is Sounds a lot cooler than it actually is. More like the Will Ferrell semi-pro league over there. And I get cut from that. But my actual pivot that I had to realize was that all that I put into playing was actually for coaching. So it's a small, just a small turn that changed my entire perspective and my entire trajectory on my life. You have also worked a lot with NBA players on both the physical and mental aspects of the game. You work with the Brooklyn Nets as a shooting coach. How much of a role does uh, the mental side of things play at the NBA level? It's everything. I've been really blessed to work with over 150 NBA players on court. I do a lot with developing players' confidence. I have a seven steps for ultimate confidence that I give to players, and it's, it's the biggest tool. Like at this level, these guys are so talented that it's just, it's, it's not separating good from great, but it's from great to outstanding. And it's how you take that next step. And, and that's all based on the mindset. Uh, this is maybe more general, but how soon after working with a player do you have a, at least an initial understanding of where their ceiling might be, if, if ever? Uh, pretty, uh, pretty early on, actually. And then the biggest determiner is what I call the difference of, will the guy drag you to the gym or do you have to drag them to the gym? Like I've had a player I've been working with for a while, Doma Sabonis, great player with the Pacers. And literally, he's dragging me to the gym every day he's out here in LA at 7 a.m. He's talented, but he's going to keep reaching a higher level because he wants it so bad. Thanks to David for joining us. For Maurice, I'm Ian. We'll see you next week on The Putback.